Hello, people. Uh, it is Saturday, and I have finished a book. I got a poodle that's going to be whining a little bit while I'm doing this. I don't know, man. That fucking dog has got, like, separation anxiety. I should really just put him inside the house, or her inside the house, before I do this, because... Because it, it really irritates me and I end up yelling at the dog. Uh, Sherman's March. <sighs> this is a fantastic book. Uh, I've actually been looking for this book. Shut up. Good God. And that's my, that's my first note there is I have looked for this book. But we found a, uh, a used bookstore here. And uh, it was right there, jumped out right in front of me. Not only have we found a used bookstore here, but we found a used bookstore that has a cat that hangs around inside the store. And I can go over there and pet that cat because I'm having kitty withdrawals here. There's, there's no cats living in this house. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's different down here because there is no basement. That fucking dog. There is no basement. Shut up! There is no basement to put the litter box in. So, even a cat lover doesn't like the smell of a litter box. So I don't know what the fuck I'm gonna do. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get a cat. I gotta get my hands on a cat somehow. And there's a cat at this bookstore, and you can go over there and pet the thing. It's a very old cat. You can feel his bones while you're petting him. But he sits there and purrs while you're petting him, so it's kind of cool. Uh, this was published in 1988. It's 302 pages. There's a big, long bibliography at the end of this book. Because the book, in large part, is made up of... Uh, it's made up of first-hand accounts. And the first-hand accounts all come from... Uh, all come from other books that people wrote, people's people's diaries and people's logs and everything. It's really cool. Uh, it starts out in Atlanta. The Sherman's army has just fought for Atlanta and taken Atlanta, and uh, that's where he begins his march. And he marches all the way through Georgia, and he marches through South Carolina, and he marches through North Carolina, and then they they meet up with another army. Uh, Schofield, I think, is is his name. And then, uh, you know, the last Confederate general that he's fighting against, the guy's name is Johnson, Joe Johnson. And uh, he, he accepts Joe Johnson's surrender not long after Lee surrendered. Shut up! The dog is just walking around whining. Uh, okay. Uh, page 5, Atlanta, fourth paragraph. I'm going to give you something to whine about. Shut up. I should really should just shut this off and start all over again. Uh, one, two, three, four. They burn Atlanta. Uh, let me just say this about Sherman's March. For a young man, a man in his 20s, some of them probably in their teens, to march through the countryside and burn and pillage and uh, I'm going to stop short of saying rape because that's not right and, uh, and they did they put to death a couple of people that were convicted of raping uh, civilians, women uh, but to burn and pillage and steal and actually put a gun to somebody's head and say I want your clothes, take them off uh, for a young man that's probably fun as hell. Uh, burning everybody's house, killing all the livestock, uh, killing what you can't eat. That's what they did. They did it for an 80 mile wide swath of territory. They just marched. Uh, they treated Georgia pretty bad, but they saved their special venom for South Carolina because apparently South Carolina was one of the the first states to secede, and uh, especially Columbia, South Carolina. So <laughs> they uh, they really burnt the fuck out of Columbia. 
So let's get to this reading here. Drunken, this is Atlanta. Drunken federal soldiers had been setting fires in the stricken city for several days, in defiance of Sherman's orders. But the official work of destruction had begun only when two Michigan regiment, regiments knocked down the massive stone roundhouse with improved battering rams, placed powder charges under large buildings, and piled mountains of worn-out wagons, tents, and bedding in the railroad depot, ready for the torch. So, yes, Michigan. <laughs> Uh, uh, and then my note here says, interesting, fourth paragraph, page 11. One, two, three, four. And this is about the makeup of Sherman's army. In all, there were 218 regiments, most of them from the West. Ohio had 52 regiments. When they're talking about the West, they mean the Midwest. Illinois had 50, Indiana 27, but there were others from Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, and Kentucky. 33 regiments came from the East, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. One regiment of white Alabama Unionists rode with the cavalry, hill countrymen of fiercely independent spirit who owned no slaves and refused to side with the arrogant plantation owners of the low country. I thought that was very interesting. And my next note says, Looting and pillaging along the mark, march. Fifth paragraph, page 36. One, two, three, four, five. On an adjoining farm, federal officers stopped and ordered dinner served to them. A meal so delicious that they kidnapped Aunt Dinah, the aged and enormously fat cook. A soldier hoisted Dinah aboard a mule's back, where she sat with ludicrous dignity, followed by the laughter of her family until she disappeared down the eastward road. Three hours later, an indignant Dinah limped back home after she had tumbled from the mule and been ad abandoned by the troops. I just thought that was funny. Uh, and then I have a note here that says first and accounts. Page 49. And uh, I didn't mark what paragraph that was. I just wrote down how it starts. The Negroes of this farm complained of Farrar's cruelty. He whoops us with strops, hand saws and paddles with holes cut in them, and then rubs salt in the wounds. They, tro they told the staff of a celebrated bloodhound on the next farm, an enormous red dog used to track down runaways. Nichols sent to have the dog killed, and when they heard a shot and a quavering howl, the Negroes shouted in triumph. For the rest of the march, the army killed most dogs in its path, and sometimes carried the hunt to ludicrous extremes. One soldier snatched a poodle from a wailing mistress. Leave my baby alone, she's all I've got. Madam, our orders are to kill every bloodhound. She's no bloodhound, she's a house pet. Well, madam, we can't tell what it'll grow into if we leave it behind. He disappeared with the dog under his arm. <laughs> I thought that was very funny, considering my situation here with the poodle. Uh, bottom of 69... I really started to, to mark a lot of stuff to read, and then then here I, I, I kind of cut off, because I don't want this video going 20 minutes. Uh, bottom of 69, top of 70. Sherman now ordered Judson Kilpatrick. Kilpatrick was, was uh, the general of his cavalry wing. Sherman now ordered Judson Kilpatrick to demonstrate against Augusta with all his cavalry a raid of about 60 miles to the northeast. Since the southern flank was now well east of Macon and out of danger from rebel concentrations there, Kilpatrick was free to shift his force across the army's front and move northward at once. By this move, Sherman hoped to draw off Joe Wheeler's cavalry to break the Augusta-Savannah Railroad and to attempt the rescue of federal prisoners from an improvised pen at the village of Millen. And, and you know what, that's, that's one of those things that, oh, I have to keep going. 
I was going to say, that's one of those things that I'm like, why the hell did I mark that? I have to keep going and read the next paragraph. Kilpatrick stowed his luggage in infantry wagons, stripped his troopers to jockey weight, and slaughtered the weakest of his horses. Troopers threw blankets over the heads of 500 animals and cracked their skulls with axes and left the carcasses on the plantation where they had camped, to the consternation of their host, who gazed about and said, My God, I'll have to move. In times of war, armies are extremely mean and they have no care at all for their animals. Just, just horrible treatment of animals. And not just horses and mules. Uh, I mean, if there's wild animals in an area and, and they're endangered or something, they don't care. They'll blast the hell out of that area. And they'll, they'll soften it up with artillery. They don't care. During the Second World War, uh, that, that pretty much spelled the doom for the European bison because starving soldiers ate the last ones. Uh, and I... Uh, Columbia, South Carolina, they really just... They, that was the capital of South Carolina. I don't know, maybe it still is. But uh, they, uh, they really just, just tore up and, and just were, they, they called them vandals. You know? even, though, even though the vandal tribe doesn't deserve that name, uh, they called them vandals because, because they, they acted like, like uh, medieval uh, 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 tribes on the move, you know. Uh, they, they, they really saved special treatment for Columbia, South Carolina. Burned the place down. And in fact, when you Google Columbia now, it will tell you when the, the uh, city was founded. And it was founded in the late 1700s. And at the end of the paragraph, it doesn't say why, but it says there are no buildings from that time period. There's no buildings from that time period because Sherman and his army destroyed them all. One more thing, this, this Kilpatrick guy, I thought it was very funny. He, uh, like I said earlier, this has got to be fun for these people. He goes through a city or a village called Barnwell, B-A-R-N, and uh, he, he sends a cable to Sherman and he says, We have decided to change the name of Barnwell to burn well, because they burn it down too. Uh, they burn everything. I do have another book. I don't know if I'm going to start it or if I'm going to maybe try to go to this other bookstore tomorrow. The, uh, the, the new book is kind of a chick book. But thanks for watching.